Alright, hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about Faraday's Law and Lenz's Law. So, um, first let's give ourselves a problem to deal with here. Suppose that we have a solenoid of, um, you know, some wrapped wire like this around sort of the cylindrical solenoid. It has a current running through the wire that induces a magnetic field within the solenoid, and only within the solenoid. Um, and that's this B here, this that magnetic field, and it is coming out at us, in it kind of out of the screen. Okay, so we have that. Sort of independent of the solenoid, we also have these rectangular loops of wire. Suppose there's n turns of this wire. What we expect to have happen is that the magnetic field from the solenoid is going to induce a current um, in this rectangular loop of wire. Uh, and what we'd like to do is we'd like to determine the direction of that induced current in the rectangular loop of wire and the magnitude of the current in that loop of wire. Okay, so let's uh, get started here. First, let's um, kind of write down some givens here that they might give us. Maybe the radius of the cylinder of the solenoid. Maybe that's 0 0.025 meters. Maybe they give us those dimensions x and y of the rectangular loops of wire. Maybe this is 15 centimeters. Maybe this is 11 centimeters. Um, let's say that they give us that the number of loops of wire is 6. They give us the resistance of that rectangular wire, so that the total resistance is 0 0.1 ohms. And then let's say that they give us the magnetic field. They tell us that the magnetic field is a uniform throughout a cross-section of that solenoid, but that it um, changes with time. So that maybe this is 0 0.07 plus 0 0.03 t squared tesla. So essentially what we're saying is we can look anywhere within that solenoid at any particular time and it'll have the same magnetic field as any other spot within that solenoid. But if we look at some different time, that magnetic field will change. Okay, so that's really what we're saying here. So first off, let's try to find, you know, the, the direction of the induced current. Again, this is the current that's induced um, in the rectangular loop of wire. Okay, so this is the first thing that we're looking for. And when we're talking about induced current, it helps to remind ourselves of Lenz's law. Lenz's law is really sort of built into Faraday's law. So let's actually start with Faraday's law. Okay. So Faraday's law mathematically is written like this. So we'd have the induced EMF, which is sometimes written as this sort of script E, sort of a fancy E like that. It's really just a voltage. It has units of volts. Um, this would just be equal to negative, and that negative sign is really that Lenz's law, and I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment, d phi b dt, where phi b here is the magnetic flux, and then if you have, as we do in our case, n loops of wire, then you would multiply that by some n, like that. And so that is Faraday's law of induction there. And the part that we're most interested in, in this particular case, where we're talking about the current direction, is this negative sign right here. That negative sign is Lenz's law. So what Lenz's law says in words is that the induced EMF, Okay, so the EMF, the voltage that's induced in this rectangular loop of wire, okay, that's that E right here, that is always in a direction that opposes, this is that negative sign, the original change in flux that caused it. So what we have here is a change in flux, a change in the magnetic flux, because the magnetic field within the solenoid is itself changing with time, right? It is dependent on time. So because it's dependent on time, we have a change in flux, d phi b dt right here, that there is some change in flux. And what we want is for the induced EMF, the, the current in this um, what, uh, rectangular loop, to oppose that change in magnetic flux. Okay, so this is um, maybe a, a little bit tricky here, so we have to be very, very careful about what we do. So, the, really, we're going to solve the majority of the problem, actually, in this first part. So, let's break down this equation. Let's really see what this says here. So, first off, it might help to think about, okay, well, what is 
phi b, right? What is that magnetic flux? And when we're talking about a uniform b field, phi b is just simply b dot a. This is, it's very, very important here that this b is uniform in the a that we're talking about, in that area that we're talking about. Okay, this is a crucial step. You can very easily make a, a very easy mistake here. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, we just said that B is uniform if we look anywhere within this cylinder, right? But the trouble is that B is not uniform. B is probably zero, as a matter of fact, outside of this. So B is approximately zero if we look within the rectangular wire, but outside the cylinder itself. Right? So B is not uniform in the entire area of this rectangular uh, wire. Right? In fact, it's zero most places with the exception of that cylinder. So we can only use this equation, this magnetic flux equation, where B is uniform. So we can only really use it inside the cylinder. So the area here that we're going to be dealing with is effectively the area of the cylinder. So let me show you um, one way that we can sort of write this. We can really break it down. Um, this b dot a, that's just simply b a cosine theta, right? And the angle between our area, which is out of the page, and our magnetic field, which is out of the page, is just zero. So cosine of zero gives us one. So this is really just b times a. And b times a, that's kind of a, uh, we're being a little too generic here, perhaps. We really want to say that this is the b the, the magnetic field from the solenoid times the area of the solenoid plus the B that's kind of outside of the solenoid but inside that rectangular wire times the area um, inside that rectangular wire, right? And the key here, so again, we're kind of thinking about this as two separate pieces, right? Here's my rectangular wire and then here is my cylinder. So that right inside of here is the area of our solenoid, but if we look kind of anywhere outside of the cylinder, but inside of this rectangle, that is what I'm calling area sort of inside that wire. Okay, and so what we just said is that the magnetic field inside here but outside of the solenoid is zero. So this whole term drops right out. So that all we're left with is B of the solenoid times the area of the solenoid. So one thing that's kind of interesting here is that we don't even really care about the area of the rectangle. That does not impact the magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is only impacted by the area of the solenoid. This is going to come into play um, later on here in part B when we're actually trying to find the magnitude of this thing. So this is, this is a pretty important point. Okay, so great, so now we have sort of an equation for phi b. What we're really interested in, it, in is the time derivative of that phi b. So d phi, oops, excuse me, d phi b dt, we're just going to simply take the time derivative of this. So this is d dt b in the solenoid times the area of the solenoid. And think back to your Calc 1 class a long time ago, we have two things that could potentially change with time, right? We have a magnetic field that could change with time, and in fact does change with time in our problem. And we have an area that could technically change with time. So let's deal with this sort of in the most generic sense here. So I'm going to do um, sort of a product rule on this. So this is going to be d, b of the solenoid, dt, and we'll keep the area the same, plus now we have b of the solenoid, having trouble writing today here, D, uh, times d a of the solenoid dt. Now one thing you may have noticed about our problem is that our solenoid has a fixed radius, right? That radius is two and a half centimeters. So our area here does not actually change with time, right? And so that's actually pretty nice for us. That, that's, that's quite helpful. Okay. So um, I'm just going to move this up here a little bit so that we have a little bit more room. All right, sort of interferes with our picture, but I think we still have the, the right idea here. Okay, so now we're, we're really rocking and rolling here. We have the area of the solenoid, 
This, in our case, is just a pi r squared sort of a thing, right? And we have dB of the solenoid dt. Well, fortunately, we were given b as a function of t. So this is actually quite helpful. So our d phi b dt in this case, and you're probably thinking to yourself, like, wow, this is a lot of work to just figure out the direction of the current. And it's true, you could take a few um, side steps here, uh, a few shortcuts that might make this a little bit simpler. But I do want to show you, you know, very blatantly what all of these steps are. So let's take a time derivative of b, right, so that we're, we're solving for this part right here. If we take a time derivative, that constant drops out. Here this 2 is going to come down in front. So we have 0 0.06 times t. That's our db dt. And then we still have the area of our solenoid, which is, in our case, pi r squared. Okay, so, so there we go. <coughs> Excellent. So we have our d phi b dt. So then um, what we see here, and this is really, I think, the most interesting part of this and the part that um, you're going to find most helpful in solving the direction of this induced current, we look at the sign of this thing. Okay, supposing that we're dealing with um, positive values of t here, it's very reasonable for this, for us to say that that is always positive, that it's always going to be greater than zero. So this is very interesting. So really what we're saying here is that our magnetic field is increasing, right? If we're saying that our flux is increasing, our magnetic field is increasing, in this particular case, again, because our area isn't changing. All right, so here we have our rectangular loop of wire and our solenoid. So our solenoid in our problem has a magnetic field that's pointing out towards you, out of the screen. And it is increasing, so it's strengthening in this direction. And what we want is for the induced current in this rectangular loop of wire to oppose that increase. So in order to oppose the increasing outward magnetic field, we should induce a magnetic field that is then opposite that. And so to induce a magnetic field that is opposite, that is kind of into the screen or away from you, we should have then, our right hand rule tells us, that we should have a current that goes clockwise around this rectangular loop of wire. Okay, so now we've seen the demo, we understand now that the, the current in this case must be going clockwise. Okay, excellent. So now let's move on to part B of this problem. We've done nearly all of the work for it, so, um, so this should be pretty straightforward. Suppose that they tell us, you know, they give us a specific time. Maybe the time is 5.9 seconds. And they tell us to find the induced current. Okay, so we're looking for the induced current in that rectangular loop of wire. So first you might be thinking to yourself, how am I ever going to, we haven't talked about current at all, really, other than direction, right? Mathematically, how am I supposed to find this? Well, if you might remember Ohm's law, V equals IR. So, I, then, equals V over R, right? So if we can find the induced voltage, or what we've been calling kind of this EMF, or script E, up until this point, then we should be good, right? We have the resistance of our wire, that's just point one, if you look back to the beginning of this problem. And so all we really need to do is solve for that induced current, or excuse me, that induced EMF, and that will give us the induced current. So here, now we can just simply say that the induced current, we're really just interested in the magnitude of this thing. So the magnitude of this is just going to be the magnitude of d phi b dt. This is coming from Faraday's law. And we've essentially already solved for that. Look at this. Here's our d phi b dt, right? It is right here. This is that 0 0.6, I'm sorry, 0 0.06 t pi r squared business. We already have done all of that work. Oh, one, um, excuse me, one other part I do not want to forget here is that because we're dealing with n turns of wire, we must have an n in both of these parts of the problem. That is important. We don't want to forget that. So now it's really just a matter of plugging all of this in. And if we do that, if you plug in all of the values that we were given at the start of this problem, you should get that um, our induced current is something like 4.17 times 10 to the negative 2 amps. And that is the end of our problem. I hope you enjoyed this video.